So kind of a longer chapter in Acts chapter 17 here, we see the Apostle Paul, you know, this is right in the middle when they're going around and they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're suffering a lot of persecution. People are persecuting them in one city, then they're going to another. They're getting persecuted in this city, then they're going to another city. And the, the part of the chapter I'm going to focus in on this morning is when he goes to Athens, right? The capital of Greece. Or he goes to Athens and as he's walking around town, he basically sees all of these different, you know, monuments, they call them devotions, you know, these, these sculptures, these statues, these altars that they have built unto various false gods. Now, I remember learning in school, you know, Greek mythology. And um, I always get the, the Roman mix, mythologies mixed up with the Greek, you know, they have all these different gods with, you know, Apollo and, and Zeus and, what, you know, and, and I know I'm not going to be saying the right thing. You know, someone's going to complain, oh, you know, that's not a Greek god. I don't care. It's not a god at all. They're false gods. That's why it's in mythology. But this is something that was real, that people really worshipped at the time, and they looked at these, you know, little G gods, these, these small gods, as being real, as, as existing, as, as a way of explaining things and, and that this was part of their religion. And they would have all these different altars up and people worshipped all these different types of gods. And at the time, the, their culture was, they always wanted to hear about something new. They said, it says in, um, we'll start reading here again in verse number 16. We'll get this story. We'll get it from the Word of God. We already read this, but we'll go through it again. The Bible says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. So he's kind of waiting for his friends. He goes to Athens and he's just hanging out. You know, they had been going into all these synagogues and preaching in all these different cities. So now here he is just waiting for his buddies to catch up with them at Athens. And just while he's there, his spirit just gets stirred up. He looks, he sees all these different false gods and idols. And it's, it's saddening to see that, you know, to see a people so deceived by these false gods. And his spirit's just getting stirred up in him. It says, therefore, so because his spirit's all stirred up and he sees all this, verse 17, you know, he doesn't keep it to himself. These people need to hear the truth. Verse 17, therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So he's preaching Christ and him crucified and him being risen again from the dead. And they're just thinking, oh, this is just another god, like add him to the list of all these other gods that they believe in. Oh, he just... It's just another, you know, a strange God. Strange just means different, right? Just a different God. One more to add to their list. It says in verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So they want to know about it. Oh, hey, this sounds interesting. Let's hear what he has to say about this. Verse 20, For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Verse 21 is a parent parenthetical verse. It's just giving the reader context here. It says, uh, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So this is what they're all about. Brother Smash, you mind moving that, that A-frame sign? It looks like it's blocking the entire entrance to the, to the parking lot. The wind is getting really strong out there, I think. So their big thing here in Athens is to just, they just want to hear something new. Oh, here's someone coming from out of town. Here's, you know, let's just hear what they have to say. And they have all these other gods anyways. Why not add one more to the mix, right? Why not set up one more idol? This is kind of the way that they're thinking. But Paul stands up. He says, okay. He starts to preach to them. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. So, 
He's telling them, look, you guys are way too superstitious. You've got all these false gods. You're so superstitious that they set up this altar to the unknown God. They're saying, well, we're going to set up an altar to Zeus. We're going to set up an altar to Thor. We're going to set up an altar to all these other gods that we know about. And you know what? Maybe we missed one. Maybe there's another God out there. So we're just going to build another altar to the unknown God. We'll say, this is to the unknown God in case we just missed one. And he's saying, and this is what they're doing. And he's saying, look, you guys are way too superstitious. You have all these things that you're doing. And he says, you know what? He says, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. He's taken that one, that unknown God. He's like, yeah, because the real God, he's unknown to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declare him unto you. I'm going to tell you all about this unknown God that you guys don't know anything about. And he preaches unto him Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. He is God in the flesh. So he's telling them all about that one that they didn't know anything about. All the other ones are false. Now, this is all just kind of groundwork for what we preach on this morning. He makes that, that statement, ye are too superstitious. They've been wrapped up in all these different idolatry and, and false religion. And what I'm going to be preaching on this morning is the subject of superstitions. And people, even Christians today, can get superstitious themselves and end up doing things and participating in things and, and thinking a certain way about things that really isn't scriptural at all. And a lot of it comes from false religion, comes from religions that, that have idolatry, just as the people here. Now, the Athenians weren't a Christian offshoot. They did idol worship. They worshiped false gods. They didn't claim to be worshiping the Lord. But a lot of this stuff that merges and melds into, you know, Christian faiths. And, and a lot of times people will, will carry over superstitions into their, their daily practice or their, their religious beliefs. So we're going to identify some of these. I'm going to try to go over some common ones, especially that, that you might see today. Now, this one isn't extremely common. Well, I guess it is. It's very common. Um, <coughs> it seems really strange to me. But in, um, I know the Mormons do this, and in the Catholic Church they do this, like praying for the dead or baptizing the dead. This is a superstitious practice. This is not something you're going to find in Scripture. And we're going to look at some Scripture. Turn back, if you would, to Luke chapter 20. If you're in Acts, just flip back over to Luke. Because here's the thing with this. Once a person has breathed their last breath, once a person has breathed their last breath on this earth, what happens to their soul and what happens to their spirit it happens already. It's done. They, their fate is sealed, if you will. So we have, everyone has a decision. See, salvation is something that you decide to do. It's a free gift to receive, but it's up to every individual to receive that free gift. Amen. There is no, but, you know, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the only way. You, know, you can have all these different religions, all these different people believe all kinds of different things. You can believe that all you want, but you're not going to get to heaven unless it's through Jesus Christ, unless you believe on him and receive him as your Savior. Okay? Amen. And that's why the Bible says, you know, whosoever believeth in me should not perish but have everlasting life. We have to make that decision. We have to con consciously decide that I am going to rest and trust, put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. I'm going, to, I'm going to rely on Him to save me. Anybody who doesn't do that, according to the Bible, the wrath of God abides on them, and they're going to go to hell when they die. Girls, sit up in your chairs and be good during service. They're going to go to hell when they die. Why? Because they didn't receive Christ as their Savior. Now, this is why I say... It's silly to be praying for people. Once they've already passed on, you cannot get that person saved if they didn't receive Christ as their Savior while they were alive on this earth. You cannot pray for that person to, to somehow receive Christ after they've passed on because guess what? The moment a person breathes their last breath, 
There's one of two places you're going to go. Now, I preach an entire sermon about the dangerous doctrine of purgatory, because purgatory is not a real place. It's something that the Catholic Church, Church teaches is real. It's like a holding cell where people who go who don't quite go to hell and don't quite go to heaven, where they need to be like purged further of their sins, as if the blood of Jesus Christ isn't enough to purge you from your sins. But that place doesn't exist. It is never found in Scripture. Show me one verse in the Bible that talks about this, this purgatory place. It's not there. It's not real. It doesn't exist. So once a person dies physically, their soul is going either to heaven or hell. And if you have everlasting life, you're going to heaven. Nothing can change that. No amount of praying by people here on earth can pull you out of heaven and send you to hell just as much as no amount of praying can pull somebody up out of hell and make them get to heaven. We see in Luke chapter 16 the story of the rich man and Lazarus, right? And this was a story that Jesus Christ is explaining that, you know, these two people, the, the, the poor man, the, the beggar Lazarus, died and so did the rich man. And then it says, you know, in hell the rich man lifted up his eyes. He was there immediately. Before, before he could even do anything, he dies, he lifts up his eyes, wow, I'm in hell. And miraculously he's able to have this conversation with Abraham and saying, look, you know, send Lazarus, send him down here, send him to my, you know, he's, he's asking him to do all these different things. He's stuck. He can't get out of there. He's not saying, send him to my brothers to pray for me that God will bring me out of this place. No, you had your opportunity. You had your chance to, to accept Christ as your Savior, to have faith. And see, salvation comes by believing. Believing is something, you know, believing in faith is, is something in the, un, in the unseen, Right? You have to have faith. If faith isn't faith, if you could see it and handle it and test it and scientifically prove something, that's not faith. Right? Because you know that it's there. You know, like, like, you know physically for a fact. But the Bible requires our salvation is based on faith. So once you're already passed on, you say, oh wait, hell's actually real. You can't just have faith then later. You, you know that it's real. You're there. See, here we have to have faith Heaven and hell is real. Jesus Christ came and died for our sins. Once you died, there's not going to be any more need for faith. You're going to know 100% for sure because you're going to be there. And Jesus Christ is the one that judges the people in hell. Okay, they're going to know who he is too. So once someone is passed on, there is no more purpose to be praying for the dead. Now, in Luke chapter 20, in verse number 37, this is where I had you turn. The Bible says, Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush, when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. So, once people have passed on, you know, God's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. You know, people will continue in heaven, they have everlasting life, but we don't, there's nothing that we can do to change the ultimate place where a person goes, their, their final destination, if you will. Now we're going to look at two uh, places in the Old Testament, in Leviticus 19. You could turn there if you'd like, and I'm also going to read from Deuteronomy 14. These are parts of the, the Old Testament law. Now, there's nothing really in the Bible talking about um, baptizing people for the dead, but in order to baptize somebody, Acts, um, Acts chapter 8 teaches us that in order to be baptized, you have to put your faith on Jesus Christ first. You have to believe, and then you can be baptized you're not going to find scriptural references to baptizing somebody for somebody else. It doesn't exist in the Bible, in the Holy Bible. But what we do see, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this could be something similar. It's not baptism, but in the law, there was something similar of doing things for people who have already died. And in God's law, in Leviticus 19, verse 28, the Bible says, Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. So this is something, like I said, it's not baptism, but he's saying making any cuttings in your flesh or like printing tattoos on yourself for people who have already died is not allowed according to God's law. And then in Deuteronomy 14, verse 1, the Bible reads, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye shall not cut yourselves, nor make any baldness between your eyes for the dead. Now, 
I don't know, I'm, to be honest with you, I don't know exactly what that means, making baldness between your eyes. Obviously, it's some kind of shaving of the eyebrows or something that they did that was a, a, a heathen practice to do something for the dead. I don't know all the details on it. I don't need to know all the details on it. But we see here two examples of people doing things, you know, for the benefit of people who have already died, which is not something that is according to God's law. And nowhere you, will you find him telling you to do something for people who have already passed on. So these are practices that, that are heathen practices that have been trying to make their way into you know, a Christian religion or you know, uh, the religion of, of, of the Lord. So that is, that is a superstitious practice. It's believing in something that has no power and no effect that people are just doing because they believe something extra will happen and it doesn't do anything. It's not scriptural. The next thing that people do that I'm gonna, you know, that's kind of superstitious is chanting. You're repeating things over and over and over and over and over again. When people pray to God, oftentimes they'll use this chanting thinking that, that somehow that's going to help them, help God to hear them or, or help them to receive whatever it is that they want. And they'll just repeat themselves over and over and over again. But see, this is again just flying in the face of clear scripture. In Matthew chapter 6, and it's kind of, it's kind of ironic here, because I remember even as a child, I grew up in a Presbyterian church, and um, I wasn't, I didn't get saved until I was 20. I remember when, uh, sometimes if I would have some problems in my life, or like when my grandfather died, some things that kind of hit real close to home, and I wanted to pray to God, and I didn't know how to pray, I would just like say the Lord's Prayer. Because I had that, have that memorized. And we would repeat the Lord's Prayer at church every week. And it's just, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The, you know, the whole thing. And just, I never understood why we did that. And to this day, it doesn't make any sense why you would do that. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 6. I'll show you. It's something that is basically a superstition. It's something that people do. And even in the context of this chapter, it amazes me that people feel the need that they have to, to recite the Lord's Prayer or over and over and over and over again, as some people do. Like, I think the Catholic Church, that's one of the, you know, they say our, Mary, the, the, our fathers and Hail Marys and whatever when you go to a, a priest and they try to tell you what you need to do because you've sinned when you confess your sins or something. These are, these are penances that they give you to... Um, to make things right with God, you just have to repeat a prayer over and over and over again. But what's silly about this is in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus Christ is explaining to them, look at verse number 7. He's telling them how to pray, right? This is how you pray. He says, but when you pray, verse 7, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So right off the bat, he says, look, when you're praying, don't use vain, rep don't just repeat yourself over and over and over again. Don't just use vain repetitions. That's what the unsaved people do. That's what the heathen do. They just think that because they speak so much, all of a sudden they're going to be heard. He says, but you, you know, when you pray, he says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And then he says, what? The Our Father, right? Our Father, which art in heaven, help be the name. So what he's doing is he's giving them an example of how to pray. This is a way that you would do it. You start off addressing your Father, which art in heaven, you know, and you ask for things. Give us our daily bread. You know, forgive us our debts as we forget you. All this teaching in here, but this is not, this was never intended or designed to be a specific prayer that you repeat over and over and over again. When you pray to God, you're asking Him for things. You're speaking to God. Now, if you need food on a daily basis like we all do, there's nothing wrong with going to God in prayer and asking for Him. But prayer should be coming from your heart of things that you want, not just repeating some words vainly that's just repeating something that's here. When Jesus Christ just said, don't use vain repetitions. If he just said, don't use vain repetitions, I don't think he's intending to say, now here's some words that you just say over and over and over again. That doesn't make any sense. 
He says, don't use vain repetitions. So that's what people will do sometimes. They'll use this chanting. And you know, and this influence comes in from like Eastern religions. You have the yoga where they'll do these mantras and they do these chantings and try to clear your mind and all this other garbage. It comes in and tries to spill its way into Christianity. And there's no place for it in Christianity, not biblical Christianity at least. The Bible tells us the opposite, not to do that. Um, turn if you to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I know it's a lot of places we're going because there's just a couple of verses for a lot of these points. I got a lot of, of points on the superstitious beliefs that people might have when they apply it to religion. But I want to give you scriptural reasoning as to why we shouldn't be doing these things and why they are just superstitions. 1 Timothy in chapter number 2. This is similar to where people are praying for the dead, but, you know, some religion will teach to pray to Mary or to pray to some of the, the saints, right? Just to praying to other people, not to dead, you know, not to, to the dead and, and the, you know, people in hell, but to people who have lived before that were godly and righteous. You know, we don't go to anybody but to God with our prayers. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 5, the Bible reads, For there is one God... And one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one person between us and God. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need to go to Mary. We don't need to go to the Apostle Paul, St. Peter, St. You know, we don't need to go to any of those people because they were just men or women anyways. They're just believers. They're no different than you or I. Now, maybe they have done some more works for God. Possibly, but they're still just a servant of the Lord. They're still just a worker for him. They don't have this extra special standing with God where they can just be like, oh, hey, I'm listening to your prayer and now I'm going to go to God. No, the Bible says there's one mediator. There's one person that could go between you and God, the, 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 the man Christ Jesus. That's it, Jesus Christ. We pray to Jesus Christ. We go to him directly. We don't need to go through anybody else. Doing so is just vanity. Now, another, another superstition that people have, and you know, it's more obvious in, in a church setting, religious, is people who use idols or will pray to inanimate objects. Sometimes people might have a, a photograph or a picture or a painting of a representation of Jesus Christ in their house. And I know some people actually get on their knees and like pray to that painting on the wall as if somehow that's going to get them closer to talking to, to God. Or they'll have, you know, like rosary beads or they'll have some other statues or shrines set up in their house. All kinds of different things that people do that are superstitious. They're inanimate objects. Exodus chapter 20, if you'd like to turn there, the second book of the Bible, Exodus 20. Exodus 20, you'll find the Ten Commandments. You find the Ten Commandments written in Exodus chapter 20. And just as we don't need to pray to the saints or pray to any other people or pray for the dead, God doesn't want us praying or, or even building or creating idol, idols or idolatry. I don't think it's right for a Christian to have a representation of, of Jesus Christ in their house. You say, yeah, but I love Jesus. Well, first of all, most of them will, will have Jesus Christ with long hair. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Doth not even nature itself teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Read the whole chapter. It, it teaches, it goes through how women have their hair as a covering, and it's a, it's a glory and an honor unto them. But for men to have a long hair, it's shame unto them. God designed men and women to be different and to look different and to wear different clothing and have different roles. And he created us different. Let's be honest. I mean, men and women are not the same. We have different type of attributes. Men are stronger. Women are weaker. But women are more nurturing and loving and caring for like children because that's the role that God intended them to be in. Whereas men are stronger and more able to go out and to work and to provide for their family. Real simple, real basic stuff here. The roles that God's uh, designed for us. But that's why... God says that it's an abomination for a man to put on a woman's garment or for a woman to wear that which pertains to a man. God doesn't want us cross-dressing. He doesn't want us mixing the gender lines and not being able to tell, is that a man, is that a woman? I don't know. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you're interested in that subject, check it out later. But, um, you know, Jesus Christ, they'll say the people have this representation of him. Nowhere in the Bible does it say he, has, he had long hair. And the Bible says that it's a shame for man to have long hair. I don't think Jesus Christ was ashamed when he was on this earth. But any representation, like an image of, of Jesus Christ like that, we can look at Exodus chapter 20, look at verse number 4. We're going to see the Ten Commandments, the first two commandments. The Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So the Bible explains here, look, don't even make the graven image, first of all. And then he says, don't bow down yourself to them. So people who are, you know, you make a graven image or a likeness of anything that is in heaven above, you know, having some representation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is in heaven. We don't need to have this, this representation that we're bowing ourselves down to and praying unto. Same thing with these, these graven images, these stone images, these carved images that people will put in their house or in their front yard or wherever. Um, it's not something that we ought to be doing. The Bible says that God's a jealous God. He doesn't want any, any um, depictions or artifacts that we create with our hands because God doesn't exist in those things and we don't need them for anything. They're vanity. They're worthless. Uh, Isaiah 44 Turn if you would there real quick. We're going to see the, the mentality of doing such a thing and how silly it is is found in Isaiah chapter 44. If you go back past Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, you're going to find the major prophets and you'll run right into Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44. <clears throat> You know, you say, well, I don't have any of those things. Well, what about like, I don't know if people still do this, but I was a kid, people talk about like having a lucky rabbit's foot, right? Or having, having these, these little charms and these little trinkets that you like bring with you because it's going to bring you good luck. And I, and I need to have my, my lucky penny or, or my lucky horseshoe or something. It's superstition. It's, that has nothing to do with God. Look, any, any extra forces in this world is going to come from God or from something that he created. It's not going to come from an object. It's not going to come from, you know, this book or, or that heater or something. You know, th these things don't carry power, right? So any little inanimate. Now, you may have a sentimental value to something, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, something that you like that brings you a memory of somebody else. That's fine, but that's not going to bring you you know, any extra power or help in, in keeping you safe or bringing you luck or doing anything like that. It's superstition. And we can apply that to what we're going to see here in Isaiah 44, in, uh, starting here in verse number 9. The Bible says, They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a God or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. Yet they shall fear and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals and fashioneth it with hammers and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes. And he marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then shall it be for a man to burn, 
For he will take thereof and warm himself, yea, he kindleth it, and baketh bread. Yea, he maketh a god and worshipeth it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down there too. He, he's trying to point out the ridiculousness of having an idol or this image, this something that you create. He's, he's talking about the blacksmith and the carpenter <coughs> and just how they do these things. You know, the blacksmith is he's using his own strength and he's pounding out this metal and, he, and he's forming this stuff with his own hands. It, it, it's something that came from nothing and man is just creating this and all of a sudden you're going to say this is a God and you're going to fall down to that and worship it? See, people see the finished product when they buy these idols. They get these little Buddhas and they get these little things and it looks so pretty and ornate and they'll bow down themselves to it and it, uh, it blows my mind. But this is the way people do it. And you know, the Bible's kind of laying this out like, look, somebody is just taking that, you know, some tree, it got nourished because it rained and they cut it down and they use some of that tree to just warm themselves in a fire. And they use that tree for other things. And then, and then all of a sudden, oh, and now we're just going to bake some bread. And then, oh, and here's a God that we're going to pull out of this. It's silly. It's ridiculous. There's, there's no God you're going to fall down and worship that's just made out of men's hands. Verse 16, he burneth part thereof in the fire. With part thereof he eateth flesh. He roasteth roast and is satisfied. Yea, he warmeth himself and saith, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof, he maketh a god. And his graven image, he falleth down unto it and worshipeth it and prayeth unto it and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my God. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes, for they cannot see in their hearts that they cannot understand. And none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned the part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have bacon bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a, of a tree? He's saying they don't even consider where it's coming from. And they're just making up this thing and calling it a God and falling down and worshiping it when it's nothing. And, and actually it's an abomination unto God. You are degrading God so low to, 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 make, to, to even think that God can exist or be just some inanimate object that you just created. The leftovers of your fire that you made dinner with, you're going to pull out a God. An all-powerful, almighty God that created everything else, somehow by the work of your hands, you just created a God. It's foolishness. It's vanity. But it's also foolishness and vanity to think that any other little trinket or object that we carry with us is going to provide any extra special powers or do anything for us. It's superstition. Let's move on to the next one. I've heard this. I've actually heard this from someone at work. I never considered this before, but there's people that believe, you know, uh, um, maybe you've heard of the witching hour or like an hour of evil or hour of darkness or something like that. And people say like 3 a.m., that's the time when like all wickedness and all evil is like at its height and it has the most power and all this other stuff. And when I heard that before, I, I, I said, that's just silly. You know, it was a conversation at work. I'm like, that's ridiculous. I don't know what you're talking about. They said, they said no, it's in the Bible. And I'm like, that is not in the Bible. And they, of course, they, you know, most people that have these superstitions, they're not going to be able to point you to a chapter and verse. They don't know the Bible themselves. They've just heard it from somewhere. Oh, yeah, that's in the Bible. The only place that I could think of where they might possibly extract that type of a belief is from when Jesus Christ was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you remember when Jesus Christ, right before he was arrested and brought to Pilate, he was praying in the garden, right? His disciples were with him. They were falling asleep. It was late at night. And then Judas came in with, with the people to arrest him and betrayed him with a kiss. And in that story, you don't have to turn it, but I'll just read for you from Luke 22. It says, um, you know, Jesus Christ said, Be come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So a regular reading of the chapter is saying, okay, 
it's time, right? Because all these other times throughout his ministry, when they tried to arrest him, they tried to kill him, it wasn't his time yet. His time had not yet come. He had more work to do, right? So they, didn't, they weren't able to just take him and do anything to him because he was being protected. Now all of a sudden, okay, the hour has come. Now it's your, your hour and it's a dark time, right? It's a power of darkness. The evil forces were at work to put him to death, but it was the right time. He says, now is, this is your hour. But to take a verse like that and say, well, we figure it must have been around midnight or three in the morning that he was praying in the garden. So this means that they have this extra special power to overcome good at this hour because that's the power of darkness. No, that's ridiculous. And, and it's silly and superstitious to even believe something like that. And see, a lot of these doctrines will come from one part of scripture somewhere and people like to run with it and use their imagination to build up these superstitions that are not really true. But we need to make sure that everything we believe and everything that we do is based off of what the Bible says. Now, I'll probably spend the rest of the time on, there's two, there's two superstitions left that, that I hear more frequently. Those are kind of real embedded in other religions and false religions. This isn't really as much steeped in a specific religion, but I hear people say things like this all the time. What, I, I've, uh, you probably have too. People will say, oh, this must have been meant to be. Every time, everything that, I mean, some people are really bad with this. Oh, well, this was meant to be. I just heard it the other day. Oh, wow, we pulled into the same aisle in a parking lot and parked across from this other. It must have been meant to be. And the extent to which people will take this type of mentality of you know, every little thing, well, this was meant to be, this was meant to be, this was meant to be. It's superstition and it's vain. Okay? People seek meaning in things that have no meaning at all for, in many cases. You're just trying to make an attachment of, of things that have an extra meaning in your life. Or you assume that things that happen in their lives happen because God made it happen. Well, somehow God wanted us to be right here. Now look, every, all of these superstitions will have some element of truth to them. Because I do believe that God will order and direct and guide our paths. I do believe that. If we're, if we're following His commandment, I do believe that God can, can lead us in ways that we might be unaware of and can help um, certain situations to come to pass. But overblowing that and exaggerating that to just every little aspect of your life, like, wow, I found, I thought the store was all out of this thing. I moved this box and there's one behind it. This must have been put here just for me to find. You know, I mean, those types of things is ridiculous. Things that happen, first of all, I want to point this out. Things that happen are not always meant to be. You know, people also use this expression, you know, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Probably everything happens for a reason. Now, yeah, I, I would, there's a lot more truth to that statement as opposed to meant to be. Everything does happen for a reason, but the reason that you think it's happening is probably not necessarily the right reason. You know, everything happens for a reason. Things happen for a reason because people sin. People, things happen for a reason because of things that you do. It doesn't have to be because God is orchestrating everything in your life. And just to prove that, you don't have to turn there. Where do I want you to turn? Turn to, uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 26. Jeremiah 26. I've got, I've got a bunch more of scripture here. But just to kind of prove this, you know, not everything is just meant to be. There are plenty of things that happen. And, you know, part of the problem, I'll get this in just a minute, is that the confusion comes from people who have kind of a Calvinist idea of things. And if you're not familiar with Calvinism, real briefly, you know, without going real in depth in the doctrine, it teaches that, you know, essentially, and some Calvinists will disagree with me, but essentially God made us like robots, like where he picks and chooses and everything that happens, like God is sovereign and is like a puppet master holding the strings and everything that happens, happens according to God. Whether it's good or whether it's bad, all things happen because that's the way God wants it to be. They say everything that happens in the world happens is because this is the way God wants it to be. That is false. Jeremiah 19, 5, as one example, 
Jeremiah 19, I had you turn to 26, so you can flip back if you want to 19. Jeremiah 19 verse 5 gives us one example. It says, They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not, nor spake it, look at this, neither came it into my mind. God said that thought never even crossed my mind. If you, could, if you could have a verse here saying, I never even thought about something so wicked as that. But yet you're going to say, well, God's making everything happen. Well, no, God didn't make that happen. That happened for a reason, but the reason is because there's some men that are extremely wicked. And what this is referring to, if you didn't catch it, is that people used to worship Satan. In the, in the name of Baal. It's called Baal worship. Now, of course, they didn't have a, a guy with horns and a pitchfork and saying, yeah, we're Satanists. It looked more like a valid religion. But it was satanic. It was not of God. And one of the things that they did in that religion was they would offer children as a sacrifice to Baal and cause them to pass through fire, burning their children alive unto a false god. That is extreme wickedness, and God says that thought never even once crossed my mind. So to say that God's just controlling everything that happens in this world is false. God doesn't, you know, God doesn't, doesn't control the, the pervert pedophile that's out there to go and defile young children and to, and to murder them and do all kinds of horrible things to them. God doesn't make that stuff happen. You can't say, oh, that happened for a reason. Yeah, it happened because that guy is extremely wicked and needs to be put to death. But it has nothing to do with God making that stuff happen. Now, we need to take events like that to happen and make the best out of them. But God's not making all of that stuff happen. So don't let yourself get too caught up into these things. Oh, well, that was meant to be. Well, no, look, someone doing that kind of stuff, that's not meant to be. That's not meant to be at all. The Bible says that, 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 you know, that God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God, what, what's meant to be is that everybody would get saved. But that's not what happens. Unfortunately, that's not what happens. But that's not what's meant to be would be that. Would be, hey, everyone gets saved and everybody follow all of God's commandments. But things that not everything that happened is meant to be. I had you turn to Genesis 26, or excuse me, Jeremiah 26. Because the problem I think that most people have is identifying the cause or the reason why things happen. They'll, they'll just have this superstitious belief of thinking that, oh, well, God must have wanted me to do all this and this and this. Instead of looking for other, other causes, like God gave us free will to decide what we want to do and where we want to go and the, things, you know, the way we want to live our life. Jeremiah 26, verse 2, um, it, it expresses this will that we have and the options that we have and different outcomes that can result based on what we do and what we choose. Verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I commanded thee to speak unto them diminish not a word. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. God's saying, preach my word unto them so that they can hear and turn from their evil ways and get the sin out of their life and start, stop doing all this wickedness but give them the choice by hearing from me so that I can repent. You saying so that the Lord, God can repent of the evil that he's planning on doing. God's saying you're living in wickedness. You're living in all kinds of sin. You need to stop doing that because if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to come and judge you. I'm going to come and bring consequences upon you. Because you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, I'm going to judge you and I'm, and I'm going to cause you know, all kinds of bad things to happen. But I don't want to do this. 
So you get right with me, and then I'll change my mind, and I won't do that. We have these types of, we have this will. We have this, this decision that we can make. Yet people want to kind of throw that, that conscious decision out the window of all, you know, when, when all kinds of bad things start to happen. Why is God putting me through all these bad things? Well, maybe you first need to just look at yourself and what, what kind of bad things have you been doing, first of all. Now, not every single time that, that bad things happen to a person is a result of you doing bad things. I'm not saying that, but that's the first place I would look. When all kinds of bad things start to happen to me, what did I do, right? Is God, is God coming down and judging me because I've been doing things that, that I shouldn't have been doing? But another thing that could happen is that maybe God's got nothing to do with it. Bad things happen because people sin against other people. People do bad things to other people. In, in the case of the, the pedophile rapist, right? He's a wicked, evil man. You know, the child can say, why did this happen unto me? Well, because he's a, he's a pervert and, he, and, and shouldn't even be living. That's why. It's not because God caused it to happen or made it happen. It's because people are allowed and given a will to, to do things. God has given us that ability to do, to do things in this world and in this life. He's given us that will. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there is a small element of truth in specific circumstances of God leading our paths and being able to, to allow for situations to arise where God has brought us to a place. If we're obeying His will and, and doing what He has laid out for us, God has work and a job for us to do. And He could lay out and, and, and open up doors for us to achieve the things we want to achieve. But it's not just every single little aspect of your life is, is God controlling it. Psalm 37, 23. You turn, if you would, to Romans 8, because I want to cover the Calvinism a little bit more, a little bit more before we're done. Psalm, uh, or Romans 8 for you. I'm going to read from Psalm 37. The Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So our steps can be ordered. They can be directed by God if we're do, you know, following his word and doing what he has for us to do. You know, I believe there's, there's been cases where We've gone out soul winning. We've gone out talking to people, knocking on doors and just trying to talk to people where God has made an allowance or provided for a situation to come up with a person. Maybe someone else has been praying for that person that, that they could have an opportunity to hear the gospel presented to them. And maybe other things have been going on in their life and that moment that we come up is a really good moment for them to hear the gospel and to receive it and not to be hard-hearted and stiff-necked against it. I believe that God sometimes will, because God knows the future, he's able to say, okay, yeah, these guys are going to be going out here and, and can maybe, you know, um, allow for situations to arise where we could, have, we could come into conversations with people because we're doing God's will. That's why we pray, I was, as I mentioned in the prayer request, that we pray that that young man that I don't know if he's saved or not, that God can send somebody and have somebody be sent to preach to him the gospel. Because God can, can do those types. I mean, God could do anything, but God's not just up there controlling all of our lives. So we're in Roman, you're in Romans chapter 8, because I think this is part of the confusion in Christian circles for just thinking that everything all the time is coming from God. <coughs> Romans 8, verse 28, the Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, right off the bat, you can look at this verse, and amen, this verse is true. All things work together to, for good to them that love God, and the Bible is clear, you know, by loving God, we're keeping His commandments. We're doing what He wants, and, wants us to do. To them who are called according to His purpose. So that's not saying that nothing bad will ever happen, but it will work together for good. So like, you think of all the persecutions that the Apostle Paul faced, for example, because it was many. I mean, he was whipped and beaten and stoned and all these bad things were happening to him. Right? Not good. You say, well, God, you know, I love you. I'm, you know, Apostle Paul was keeping his commandments and doing the right thing. So you can say, why are all these bad things happening to me? It's not that God was causing those bad things to happen to him. No. Bad people were causing bad things to come on him because he was having an impact and doing the right thing. But God was able to use those things 
for the good. A lot more people and the power of the preaching was, was magnified because people could hear about this and, hey, look, here's somebody. When you could listen to someone and say, I am still and, and, and devote and going to continue to preach Jesus, even though I'm being faced with death, I'm being faced with beating, I'm being faced with all this stuff, that's conviction. That gets people's attention. People will stop and listen and be like, whoa, wait a minute. You're not going to just like shut up and just not say anything because, I mean, come on. Like, who wants to go through all that stuff? But when someone has a belief... And, and is fervently serving the Lord and has this great zeal, it gets a lot more attention. A lot more people are going to be willing to listen to what you have to say when you're going through so much in order to get that message out. It shows, it demonstrates the importance of the message by going through all those bad things. And see, God was able to take some of those bad events and use it for good because a lot of people got saved as a result. So the things that were happening to Paul that were bad turned out to be good things. But it doesn't mean that God, you know, one, caused the bad things that happened in Paul's life or that, they, that, that Paul was the reason why they happened. You know, not from his own sin necessarily, but it's from, you know, people just, just invoking their own will upon him. But let's keep reading here. I want, I want to make sure we get a good understanding of verse 28 because it, it continues on here. It says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? This is the type of, of these are the types of verses that could get people to start thinking that, well, God is making everything happen, which is not what the verses are saying here. But you could say, oh, well, I'm predestinated. And, and this is one of the things that Calvinists believe is that, well, you're all ready before you're even born. You're just predestinated to either be saved or to go to hell. This predestination doctrine is false. Because the, the most important part of this in verse 29, when he talks about people being predestinated, is in verse 29, it starts off, for whom he did foreknow. Those are the ones he predestined. See, God has all knowledge. We live in our existence bound by time. We don't even understand, it's, it's hard to understand being outside of time as God is. God created time. We have no other concept of things than things having a beginning and an end. Birth, death, you know, it, continuing on moment by moment by moment by moment. Every, every moment of our life it exists in time. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows the whole thing. He knows what you're going to do next week, next year, tomorrow, every single day of your life. God already knows what you're going to choose. But because he has that knowledge, it doesn't mean he makes you do those things. He just has the knowledge. He's created you. He says, okay, here you go. You have free will. He lets you do what you want to do. But he knows what you'll do in the end just because he has all knowledge. Those that he knows are going to believe on Jesus Christ in their life, yeah, he's predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his son. He's, he's saying, okay, this is your destiny because, because I know that you are going to believe. That's the predestination that occurs. But it's not just saying that God made you to do that that way and, and that, that you really didn't ever have a choice. That's false doctrine. And it continues on in Romans. I'm not going to get too deep in this because I, I could pre you know, Calvinism is kind of a, a deeper um, false doctrine that requires an exhaustive uh, going through the, the scriptures to kind of prove all the points on that. And I don't want, I have more here, but I'm running out of time. I wanted to get to this last point real briefly. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Last place we'll turn, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <coughs> Because there's superstition that people have, and this is propagated by the movies and the music in our culture. The popular movies, you have romance movies, and then you have music, you have these love songs and these ballads that will teach you that there is only one person out there that's your soulmate that you need to get married to. And this is, this is a superstitious belief that people have. I need to find that right one. There is one person out there that's just right for me, and I got to find that one person. 
That is not what the Bible teaches. That is this, this lie, this fantasy that's been, been dreamed up that, that, you know, a lot of women they like to hear that. Oh, wow, there's one guy that's just for me. I need to find him. And, and, and you watch these sappy movies that pull at your heartstrings and you know, all these crazy things happen and he's the one. He's my soulmate. That's the one I'm meant to be with. And, and even in the, in the music. I mean, you hear it. These, these, you're the one. You're the reason. You are everything. You know, like, like, like it's, it's this, this mysticism that there is only one other person out there for you that one true love. And people, the problem with this, and the reason why I'm actually kind of passion, passionately against this is because people get so wrapped up into this, they'll start questioning, I'm already married. But I don't, I don't, I don't think that my spouse is the one. I don't think my husband is that one soulmate. I don't think my wife is that one true love that I have that, that, that the movies and music is telling me about. Because what happens oftentimes when people get married at first, you're infatuated with each other. You, you, know, like, you just want to spend all your time together and it's great and, and it's awesome and it's a great time of your relationship. You're getting to know each other. Things are exciting. But when you get married, that doesn't always last through 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of marriage. That initial excitement phase of, of getting to know somebody. You, you get used to each other. You get to know each other very well. Sometimes you get to know things, you know, get irritated with things that happen. And those irritations that happen can start to cause you to think, Maybe this isn't the right person for me. Maybe, maybe you, feel, you, you feel different. You say, I don't feel the same way that I did. Maybe it's because this isn't the right one. Maybe I made the wrong choice. Maybe I, you know, and people start to get this because they have this mentality of thinking that there's only one person for me. Only one person I need to find. I made a mistake. Now I need to find. Oh, and, th and then, you know, they're having these other problems. Their marriage is starting to question things. Along comes some other guy, some coworker, or somebody else. And now all of a sudden they start to have feelings for this person. And they click and they communicate real well. Before you know it, oh, this must be my soulmate. We get along. I don't really get along with this guy anymore. <coughs> Adultery, divorce, ruined marriages, ruined lives, broken families is a result of that way of thinking. The Bible tells us, here in 1 Corinthians 7, in Proverbs 18, verse 22, the Bible says, Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. If you found a wife, if you're married, you found a wife, hey, you found a good thing. He didn't say, whoso findeth the wife. The one wife for you. When you find that one wife, hey, you found a good thing. No, who so findeth a wife? You found someone that's willing to get married to you? Good, good job, man. Stick with her. <laughs> She's willing to commit her life to you? Great. Hold on to that. That's a good thing. There's not just one. If you find a what you find someone that you'd like to marry, that you like and they like you back. You want to commit yourselves to each other for the, your entire life? Great. Stick with that person. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 2 says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. This is the Apostle Paul teaching about you know, people get married. Hey, look. You don't want to be in fornication. You don't want to be having this, this relationship that you'd like to have with this other person. He's like, just get married. And avoid that. Avoid, avoid the sin of fornication and get married. He wouldn't give that advice if he said, well, make sure that this is that only one that God has made for you two to be together. No, he said, look, you want to have this relationship with this person? You love her that much? You want to, you want to experience that? Then get married. Jump down to verse 39. The Bible also says here um, in 1 Corinthians 7, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Now, obviously this is saying, okay, you're, you, know, you, you make a vow, you're bound by your marriage till death do you part. So 
as long as your, your, your spouse is still alive, you're bound to that person. You've, you've made that commitment. But you become a widow. Your, your spouse has died. Okay. He's all out his woman. Her husband's dead. Hey, you're, you're at liberty. You could be married to whoever you want. God's given us, hey, marry anybody. Marry whoever you want. The only stipulation, he says, is only in the Lord. God doesn't want us unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So what he's saying here is that you're saved, you're a child of God. Don't get married to somebody who's not a believer in God. He said, don't get yourself yoked up and, and paired up for life with somebody who doesn't believe on Jesus Christ. And there's many good reasons for that. I don't think I have to spell them all out for you. But the Bible tells us, he said, that's the one thing, that, the one condition that he wants you to abide by. Anybody you want, you have liberty, you have freedom, just make sure it's in the Lord. Make sure that that person is, is a believer. That's it. And other than that, hey, get married to whoever you like. It's up to you to choose. But then once you make that decision, stick with that person. That is the one who is right for you. You don't have to worry, is this the right person? If you're married, yes. The answer is just yes. No, yeah. If you're married, yes, that's the right person. Stick with that person. God hates divorce. And um, we'll close with that. Let's uh, bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, for your great words. And I pray that you please help us not to be too superstitious in our lives, dear Lord, by applying meaning to things that, that don't really have any meaning or to be doing uh, religious practices that are not found in Scripture that really ultimately are just superstition, dear Lord. They're not founded and based in fact, dear God. I pray that you would please just help us to be aware of these things and that we wouldn't um, be making uh, foolish decisions based on a superstitious belief rather than based on a biblical belief. Dear Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.